and welcome to this video, which is a summary of this Napoleon biography written by Andrew Roberts. If you have clicked on this video, you might already know that the Ridley Scott movie Napoleon starring Joaquin Phoenix is coming out in a couple of days. And so I thought it would be fun to do a bit of background reading. As is usual with videos like this, I only used the book as a source. I know that there's a wealth of information out there, which I actually can't wait to get into, but I always like to read one really good biography from start to finish as my starting point. Oh, and I also put in some timestamps, which might be helpful. Anyway, onto the video. Napoleon de Bonaparte, as he signed himself, was born on the island of Corsica on August 15th, 1769, to parents Carlo Bonaparte and his wife Maria Letitia Ramalino. The Bonaparte family were originally landowners living between Livorno and Florence, and while some stayed in Italy, Francesco Bonaparte immigrated to Corsica in 1529, and by the time that Napoleon was born, some two and a half centuries later, the family was part of the minor nobility in Corsica. Napoleon would rarely talk about his Italian heritage, but he would sometimes boast that he was a descendant of the Roman Empire. Growing up, Napoleon admired Pascal Paoli, Corsica's nationalist leader who fought for independence from Genoa. Genoa had ruled over Corsica for over two centuries. And he won in 1775 as a lawgiver, reformer, and benevolent dictator. Genoa didn't want to battle, so they sold the island to King Louis XIV of France for 40 million francs. Paoli opposed the Corsican ruler appointed by the French foreign minister, so the French sent 30,000 troops to put down the rebellion, and they replaced the ruler with a Frenchman. When Corsican forces were later defeated and Paoli went into exile, Carlo, who was Paoli's private secretary, pledged an oath of loyalty to King Louis and that's how he was able to retain his position on the island. He became what one of his sons called a good Frenchman, seeing an advantage to this union with the French. Carlo was appointed to represent the Corsican nobility in Paris in 1777, a position that saw him visit King Louis XV at Versailles twice. It's rumored that Napoleon despised his father for switching sides, but there's no actual evidence for this. Even though Napoleon wrote foully, denouncing those who switched sides, he never mentioned his father, plus he named his son Charles, something that he likely wouldn't have done had he hated his father. Carlo personified precisely the kind of non-Frenchman whose willingness to collaborate with France was later vital to the smooth running of the Napoleonic Empire. Carlo was an intellect familiar with Enlightenment thinkers, and he even wrote Voltairean essays, but he also liked to spend, even though the family's income wasn't consistent or substantial. This is how the family debt started to accumulate. Napoleon inherited little from his father beyond his debts, his blue-gray eyes, and the disease that would lead them to their early deaths. Letitia, Napoleon's mother, her father held a high position in government in Corsica, and so her dowry included 175,000 francs, a house with an adjoining apartment, and a vineyard. So Napoleon's parents married, even though Carlo is believed to have loved another woman at the time of his wedding. Letitia had 13 children between 1765 and 1786, eight of whom survived infancy, and eventually they would become emperor, three kings, a queen, and two sovereign princesses. Once he came into power, Napoleon was very generous, giving his mother an annual income of one million francs and buying her a chateau. She squirreled money away and she would joke, who knows, one day I may have to find bread for all these kings I've born. One of the features that emerges strongly from Napoleon's correspondence is his deep and constant concern for his family. Whether it was his mother's property on Corsica, the education of his brothers, or the marriage prospects of his sisters, he was endlessly seeking to protect and promote the Bonaparte clan. This would later damage his own interests. Napoleon had a persistent cough as a child, and his post-mortem showed that he'd suffered from tuberculosis, although by the time he died, he had long since been healed. Not much is known about his childhood, but Napoleon was a precocious and prodigious reader, and he was drawn to history and biography at an early age. His mother once said that, that her son had, had never partaken of the amusements of children his own age, that he carefully avoided them, that he found himself a little room on the third floor of the house in which he stayed by himself and didn't come down very often, even to eat with his family. Up there, he read constantly, 
especially history books. Later in life, Napoleon urged his junior officers to read and reread the campaigns of Alexander the Great, Hannibal, Julius Caesar, Gustavus Adolphus, Prince Eugene, and Frederick the Great. This is the only way to become a great captain. His native language was Corsican, and at school he was taught Italian, but he was already 10 by the time he learned French, which he spoke with a heavy Corsican accent. This caused some teasing at school and in the army. By all accounts, though, his childhood was an uncomplicated and happy one. In 1770, an edict was issued declaring that all Corsicans who could prove two centuries of nobility were allowed to enjoy the privileges of the noble class. In 1771, Carlo applied to have the family recognized as one of the island's 78 noble families. He could now legally sign himself de Buonaparte for the first time and sit in the Corsican assembly. He could also apply for royal bursaries for his son's educations. Napoleon then went off to France, or the continent as the Corsicans called it, and he wouldn't returned to Corsica for another eight years. In 1779, Napoleon was admitted to the Royal Military School of brienne les chateaux in the Champagne region, and this provided Napoleon with a fine education. His eight hours of study a day included mathematics, Latin, history, French, German, geography, physics, fortifications, weaponry, fencing, dancing, and music. You see, Brienne was also finishing school for the noblesse. Physically tough and intellectually demanding, the school turned out a number of distinguished generals besides Napoleon. Napoleon excelled at mathematics. To be a good general, you must know mathematics, he later observed. It serves to direct your thinking in a thousand circumstances. And he was helped by his prodigious memory. A singular thing about me is my memory, he once boasted. As a boy, I knew the logarithms of 30 or 40 numbers. Napoleon was given permission to take maths classes earlier than the prescribed age of 12, and he soon mastered geometry, algebra, and trigonometry. His weakest subject was German, which he never mastered. Another weak subject, surprisingly for somebody who adored ancient history, was Latin. His intellectual superiority didn't really endear him to his classmates who teased him for his accent, for being poorer than the rest of them, and for his head, which was too big apparently. Later on, Napoleon would talk about some of his teachers, the ones that he liked, but very few fellow students. Napoleon took his final exams at Brienne on September 15th, 1784. He passed easily and late the following month, he entered École Royale Militaire in Paris. He was also the first Corsican to do so. This was a more socially elevated institution and of course Napoleon continued to excel intellectually. By the time Napoleon had spent five years at Brienne and one at École Militaire, he was thoroughly imbued with military ethos, which would stay with him for the rest of his life and was to colour his beliefs and outlook deeply. On February 24th, 1785, Napoleon's father Carlo, 38 years old, died probably of stomach cancer, possibly a perforated ulcer. He was in the south of France at the time where he was seeking treatment. Napoleon was only 15 at the time and although Joseph was Carlo's eldest son, Napoleon quickly established himself as the new head of the family. He took his final exams and an extended leave from the military to deal with his family matters. In September 1785, at the age of 16, Napoleon was one of the youngest officers and the only Corsican to hold an artillery commission in the French army at Valence. It was here that he wrote his first surviving essay about the right of Corsicans to resist the French. He had finished his schooling, so it was written for himself rather than for publication, an unusual pastime for French army officers of the day. He wrote around 60 essays, novellas, philosophical pieces, histories, treaties, pamphlets, and open letters before the age of 26. In September 1786, after an absence of nearly eight years, Napoleon returned to Corsica and met his three youngest siblings for the first time. It was the first of five trips home between 1786 and 1793, some lasting many months, largely in part to deal with the various problems left by his father's estate. In 1788, stationed in eastern France, not far from Dijon, he would eat only once a day in order to save enough money of his military salary to send home to his mother, and the rest he spent on books. The French Revolution, which broke out on July 14th, 1789, when a Parisian mob stormed the state prison, the Bastille, was preceded by years of financial crises and turmoil. Napoleon welcomed the revolution in its early stages. It aligned with some of his enlightenment Enlightenment ideals he'd had from reading Rousseau and Voltaire. He also didn't mind the weakening of a monarchy that he didn't respect. This also represented career opportunities for an ambitious young outsider without money or connections. When in January 1790, 
2020, the National Assembly passed a decree making Corsica a department of France. Napoleon supported the move. Fowley denounced it from London as a measure designed to impose the will of Paris. Napoleon now saw Paris as an ally in the task of revolutionizing Corsica, and a major split was likely if Fowley returned to the island. In June 1791, Napoleon was promoted to lieutenant and transferred to the 4th Regiment of Artillery back at Valence. Napoleon was in Paris on June 20, 1792, when the mob invaded the Tuileries and captured Louis XV and Marie Antoinette and forced the king to wear a red cap of liberty on the palace balcony. Two days later, he wrote to his brother describing the scene. Between seven and 8,000 armed men with pikes, axes, swords, guns, spits, sharpened sticks went to the king. The Tuileries gardens were closed and 15,000 national guards were on guard there. They broke down the gates, entered the palace, pointed the cannon at the king's apartment. Napoleon felt that this was unconstitutional and it set a bad precedent having the rabble enter the palace grounds. He couldn't understand how King Louis could have allowed himself to be so humiliated. Austria and Prussia invaded France 10 days later, adding to the suspicions that the king and his Austrian wife sympathized with the invasion and were collaborating with the enemy. On September 21st, 1792, France formally declared itself a republic and the assembly announced that Louis XV would be tried for collaboration with the enemy and crimes against the French people. He got the guillotine on January 21st, 1793, and Marie Antoinette followed shortly after. The revolutionary regime then declared war on Britain. Under the Tory government of William the Younger, Britain was to become by far the most consistent of all the opponents of revolutionary and Napoleonic France. To the Brits, the unyielding opposition to the French Revolution and later Napoleonic France was not only a moral and ideological imperative, it also made perfect geopolitical sense in affording Britain the opportunity to replace France as the world hegemon. Months after King Louis' execution, Napoleon was given his first significant command. And on June 11th, 1793, the whole Bonaparte family arrived in Toulon as political refugees with little more than Letitia's life savings and Napoleon's modest salary as a captain in the 1st Regiment to pay for the fatherless family of nine. Napoleon joined his regiment in Nice and by December 1793, at 24 years old, he was made a general. By early summer 1794, Napoleon began to court Eugenie Desiree Clary, the pretty 16-year-old daughter of a dead royalist textile and soap millionaire. Her older sister Julie had married Napoleon's brother Joseph that year, bringing with her a dowry of 400,000 francs, which ended the Bonaparte family's money worries. Desiree and Napoleon were engaged the following April. She would eventually reject him, though, and it was Desiree's rejection of Napoleon which contributed to his deep cynicism about women and even about love itself. On Saint Helena, he defined love as the occupation of the idle man, the distraction of the warrior, the stumbling block to sovereignty. Desiree would end up marrying General Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte, and she would become Queen of Sweden. But Napoleon always would have a place for her in his heart. Just a side note, I don't really know how much of a cynic he was about love because we're going to see the love letters that he wrote later on. Those are love letters of a true romantic and a poet. But anyway. In the autumn of 1795, France's leaders recognized that the country would need a new constitution. This moment of reform provided an opportunity for opponents both of the revolution and the republic to strike. It was in the sections, 48 districts of Paris, that the insurrection was focused. Napoleon heard that the sections intended to riot and he was appointed second in command of the army of the interior and in order to crush the revolt by any means necessary. This was Napoleon's first introduction to frontline high level national politics and he found it intoxicating. If you treat the mob with kindness, he told Joseph later, these creatures fancy themselves invulnerable. If you hang a few, they get tired of the game and become as submissive and humble as they ought to be. The fighting continued for many hours until Napoleon brought out his cannon to within 60 yards of the church and surrender was the only option. In the aftermath, one of his tasks was to oversee the confiscation of all civilian weaponry, which, according to family law, led to his meeting with, guess who? Vicomtesse Marie-Joseph Rose Tasha de la Pagerie. Napoleon would call her 
Josephine. She was born on the 23rd of June, 1763, but she would later smudge that a little bit and said it was 1767. Josephine's father was a page in King Louis XV's court. And by the time she arrived in Paris at age 17, she was so poorly educated that her first husband couldn't hide his contempt for her lack of education. She also had blackened stubs for teeth, thought to have been from chewing sugar cane as a child. She would eventually learn how to smile without showing them. Her husband was guillotined four days before Robson Spears fall and she survived because she was too ill to be guillotined at the time. Her ordeal of being imprisoned caused her to suffer from PTSD and she became sexually self-indulgent. She married for money and financial security and had dress bills higher than those of Marie Antoinette. She wasn't culturally shallow though, she was a skilled harpist and she had good taste in music and decorative arts. By late 1795, this undeniably sexy femme fatale in her mid-30s with a closed mouth smile needed a protector and a provider. Josephine took the opportunity of the arms confiscation to send her 14-year-old son Eugene to Napoleon's headquarters to ask whether his father's sword could be retained by the family for sentimental reasons. Napoleon took this for the social opening that plainly was, and within weeks he had fallen genuinely and deeply in love with Josephine. His infatuation only grew until their marriage five months later. At first, she wasn't attracted to his slightly yellow complexion, lank hair, and unkept look nor presumably to his scabies, and she certainly wasn't in love with them. But she herself was beginning to get wrinkles, her looks were fading, and she was in debt. She sensibly didn't admit the extent of her debts until she had Napoleon's ring on her finger. Napoleon valued her political connections, her social status as a vicomtesse who was also acceptable to revolutionaries, and the way she compensated for his lack of social graces. The couple married on March 9th, 1796, and Napoleon was late for his wedding, and his honeymoon only lasted 48 hours because he was given command of the army of Italy. He left for his headquarters of the army of Italy and at this point he was 26 years old. When Napoleon arrived in Nice, to the Italy army headquarters, he found his army in no state to move anywhere. It was freezing and the men had no overcoats and no meat had been issued there for three months and bread arrived only irregularly. Mules pulled the artillery since all the draft horses had died of malnutrition and entire battalions were shoeless or in clogs, wearing makeshift uniforms often taken off the dead. Napoleon got to work right away, setting things in order and the staff were positively affected by his energy and hard work. On April 2nd, 1796, Napoleon moved the army's headquarters forward to Albenga on the Gulf of Genoa. The Austrians, who had dominated northern Italy since 1714, were sending a large army westwards to Piedmont to engage the French. Napoleon wrote daily letters to Josephine, some on the same day as major battles, though she hardly wrote back, something that he would actually mention in his letters. Napoleon's letters were full of coy, erotic allusions to his desire to ravish her as soon as he would come back as soon as she would come out to join him in Italy. Remember, she was in, still in Paris at this time. A kiss on your breast, and then a little lower, and then much lower, he wrote once. The army, however, was still in a terrible state and was outnumbered against the 80,000 Austrians. Still, when the fighting was over, the Austrians lost 2,500 men and Napoleon only 800. This was Napoleon's modest first victory in the field as commander-in-chief. Napoleon was keen to have Josephine join him in Italy, but she told him that she couldn't because she was pregnant. Napoleon was thrilled excited to see her belly and raise their family. It's possible that Josephine either had a phantom pregnancy or a genuine miscarriage, but there would be no child. There were, in fact, also other distractions preventing her from joining her husband in Italy. She was pursuing an affair with a lieutenant called Hippolyte Charles, who was nine years younger than her. Over the course of the next three years, Napoleon worked on some reforms in the newly conquered territories of Italy. He wanted to establish a new Italian political culture based on the French Revolution that would prize meritocracy, nationhood, and free thinking. In the meantime, he was distraught and growing increasingly desperate at Josephine not writing him and the fact that she remained in Paris. He even became suspicious that she might have had a lover and that was what kept her in Paris and that she didn't love Napoleon anymore. In the middle of this hurricane, Cain in his private life and the growing gnawing realization that the woman he worshipped was at best lukewarm in her affections towards him, Napoleon was putting the finishing touches to a bold campaign plan that would lead to a string of seven more victories on top of the five he'd already won. 
the capture of Mantua and a plan eventually for the expulsion of Austria from Italy after three centuries of Habsburg rule. On June 26th, Josephine finally left Paris for Milan. She also brought her lover along. She, she arrived at the Cerebelloni Palace on July 10th and Napoleon was somehow oblivious to her lover. Josephine seemed receptive to his affections as well. That didn't last long though. When he had some military campaigns, she would go off traveling and when he'd come home, she'd be nowhere to be seen. I arrive at Milan, Napoleon told Josephine on 27th of November in a letter, who was still holidaying with her lover in Genoa. I rushed to your apartment. I have left everything to see you, to press you in my arms. You are not there. You run from town to town after the fates. You leave as I am about to arrive. You do not concern yourself about your dear Napoleon anymore. The whole world is only too happy if it can please you, and your husband alone is very, very unhappy. Napoleon always wanted territory in northern Italy as he believed that he would be in the heart of Germany thereafter. Four fortresses known as the Quadrilateral held the key to Austrian power in northern Italy and Mantua was one of them. Mantua was occupied by the Austrian army and on June 2nd, 1796, Napoleon began his siege. And while the suffering was immeasurable, the citizens had been reduced to eating rats and dogs, the campaign was ultimately successful for Napoleon. The fact that the Austrian forces were superior area in number and the fact that the army of Italy was in any position to fight at all, given the state that Napoleon found them in, was another testament to his leadership qualities. He also enjoyed spending time with his soldiers. He was approachable and he allowed his men to bring forward their cases for being awarded medals, promotions, and even their pensions. Napoleon also staged a coup in Venice when he sensed that there was a threat arising there. Venice wanted to guard its independence, but 5,000 French troops entered on May 16th and eventually a treaty was signed with the new pro-French puppet Venetian government. Napoleon's main residence by the spring of 1797 was the Palazzo of Mombello outside of Milan with his family who he had invited to live with him. He often dined with Italian nobility and adopted a royal etiquette around the residence. The political situation in Paris was unstable with inflation out of control and, and a populace that had growing discontent for the government. Napoleon promised war on the enemies of the Republic and the Constitution. By late July, Napoleon had decided that he would support a purge of the French government and legislature, ridding it of its royalists and moderates, whom he thought were endangering the Republic. Then came the Egypt campaign. Napoleon described Egypt as the geographical key to the world. His strategic aim was to damage British trade, in the region and replace it with French. Or at the very least, he hoped that he could stretch the Royal Navy by forcing it to protect the mouths of the Mediterranean and the Red Sea and the trade routes to India and America simultaneously. On July 19, 1798, Napoleon was made aware of Josephine's affair with Charles, even though he might have already suspected it. Evidence in the form of a letter was shown to him and he was told that his cuckolding was the talk of Paris. No letters between Josephine and Napoleon survived throughout his time in Egypt, and perhaps they were lost, but historians think that this is because the couple just didn't write to each other during this time. So the situation in Egypt at the time was that the Ottoman Turks had conquered it in 1517, and they still officially ruled it. However, the control had been taken from them by Mamluks, a military caste originally from Georgia, these warlord princes were unpopular with ordinary Egyptians who thought them foreigners and the Mamluks also imposed high taxes on the people. For the French then, another appeal then for invading Egypt was the promise of extending liberty to the people oppressed by foreign tyrants. The French were victorious in the Battle of the Pyramids and a day after this battle, Napoleon entered Cairo, a city with 600,000 inhabitants. He set up his headquarters and, and got to work shortly thereafter. By direct decree, Napoleon established a postal system, street lighting and cleaning, coach service between Cairo and Alexandria, a mint and a rational, less extortionary tax system. He also abolished feudalism, replacing it with the rule by the diwans or councils set up a new French trading company, built modern plague hospitals, and produced Egypt's first printed books in three languages. None of these reforms were undertaken on the orders from the directory back in Paris, who were unable to get messages through. They were entirely on Napoleon's initiative. It's written that the greatest achievements of, po of Napoleon's in Egypt were in fact intellectual, cultural, and artistic ones. The first volume of 
Description de l'Egypte was published in 1809 by order of Napoleon the Great, constituting a monument in the history of scholarship and publishing. As well as ancient Egyptology, the volumes contained exceptionally detailed maps of the Nile, modern cities and towns, sketches of irrigation courses and drawings of monasteries and temples, different types of columns, cirques, tombs, mosques, canals, fortresses, palaces and citadels. Napoleon was meant to return to Paris after the conquest in Egypt was secure, but he wrote to Paris saying that there would be some delay in his return. In the letter to the directory, he lied and he said that the Egyptians were taking to French rule. On October 20th, Napoleon learned that a Turkish army was gathering in Syria to attack him. It was only the zealots who revolted though. Due to the harsh defense measures by Napoleon, the ordinary people of Cairo, while they might not have wanted to be ruled by the French, they did not rise up against the French. By November 11th, the revolt was over. And Napoleon also took a lover for a time, Pauline Forest, a 20 year old wife of the lieutenant. It had been six months since Napoleon found out that Josephine had had her own affair. Now, Napoleon's affair deflected charges of cuckoldry from Napoleon, which for a French general was far more serious than accusations of adultery. Although Napoleon never set foot in present-day Syria, he did embark on a Syrian campaign, but he stays in the bounds of modern Gaza, Israel, and the West Bank. By 1799, Napoleon's rule extended almost the whole of the country, and so now he could unleash an attack against Ahmed Jazar, the Pasha of Accra. Napoleon tried to negotiate with Jazar, who was known for being particularly cruel and torturous. He killed seven of his wives, but it obviously didn't work. Jazar rejected this overture and he decided to make peace with the Ottomans. Accra would be among one of the only losses out of Napoleon's total 60 battles and seizures. Napoleon began his assault on Accra on March 19th. He launched no fewer than nine major and three minor attacks over the next nine weeks. The only reason to take Accra had been to pursue his dream of attacking India via Aleppo and setting up a French empire in Asia, stretching to the Ganges or possibly to capture Constantinople. This wasn't really realistic or achievable, especially once the Syrian Christians made it clear that they were going to stay loyal to Jazar. So, Napoleon made it about turn, telling his men that the capture of Accra wasn't worth it. The French left their siege lines on May 20th, 1799, and this was Napoleon's first significant reversal of his career. Whether because he was angry at this or to deter Jazar from following him closely, Nap Napoleon employed scorched earth tactics on his way back to Egypt, laying waste to the Holy Land. Napoleon re-entered Cairo on June 14th, and he told his army that he'd been recalled to France by the government, which was untrue. At noon on Wednesday, October October 19, 1799, he stepped ashore in France at an inlet nearby Saint Raphael. That same evening, he was on his way to Paris. The Egyptian adventure was over for Napoleon after nearly a year and five months, though not for the French army he had left behind. They would remain there until General Menou was forced to capitulate to the British two years later. It had been six months since Napoleon had learned of Josephine's infidelity, so much of his anger was spent and he had retaliated comprehensively with his lover Pauline. A divorce might damage him politically, especially with devout Catholics, and Josephine was helpful to him, especially politically, with her royalist and social connections, as well as in smoothing over sensibilities of those rebuffed by his brusqueness. She kind of like smoothed out his rough edges with certain crowds. They would stay together with Josephine being faithful to him, but Napoleon was never again faithful to her. He did forgive her fully though, and after the affair, he never brought it up again. Only a ghost of a government remained in France, so the Directory was at the mercy of the first assault. There were many plots to overthrow the Directory, but one coup plot in particular, brainchild of Abbe Sieres, resulted in Napoleon coming to power. Sayes was reluctant, but his first choice was fatally wounded in battle, and Napoleon was popular with Parisians. Sayes also felt that the old directory was too incompetent and corrupt at dealing with issues that faced Paris. Napoleon's coups were bloodless and successful. Late December saw the formal installation of what would become the institution of Napoleonic rule. On January 17, 1800, Napoleon closed no fewer than 60 of France's 73 newspapers, saying that he wouldn't allow the papers to say or do anything contrary to my interests. Napoleon also blocked the circulation of foreign newspapers within France. He believed that any attempt to foster national unity would be impossible if royalist newspapers were permitted to 
foment discontent. And yeah, he was made first consul. On February 19th, 1800, Napoleon left the Luxembourg palace and he took up residence at the Tuileries. When Napoleon moved in, he took King Louis's first floor rooms overlooking the gardens laid out by Catherine de Medici and Josephine took Marie Antoinette's suite on the ground floor. In less than 15 weeks, Napoleon had effectively ended the French Revolution, seen off Abyssinia, given France a new constitution, and established her finances on sound footing. He muzzled the opposition press, made spurned peace offers with the British in Austria, won a plebiscite by a landslide, even accounting for fraud, recognized French local government, and inaugurated the Banque de France. Now that Napoleon was back in Paris and as first consul, he he wanted to turn his attentions to Austria. He planned to do this by crossing the Alps into northern Italy. In total, 50,400 men crossed the Alps and saw a success in the Battle of Marengo against the Austrians, who then retreated. Marengo confirmed Napoleon in his position as first consul and added to the myth of his invincibility. Sure though, Napoleon was a brilliant military mind, but it's said that we shouldn't underestimate the amount of luck that was involved. Napoleon himself spoke more than once of the goddess of fortune. Napoleon also wanted to ensure that no independent church would provide a focus of opposition to his rule and the simplest solution was to co-opt the Pope. When he returned from Milan to Paris, he started negotiations with the Vatican, offering full public worship in France if all bishops retired. That way, he could be allowed to choose others who would then be nominated by the Pope. He also had the most important task, which was to unify France's 42 legal codes into a single system. Code Napoleon consisted of a reasoned and harmonious body of laws that were to be the same across all territories administered by France for the first time since Emperor Justinian. Among other things, it guaranteed the equality of all Frenchmen in the eyes of the law, freedom of person from arbitrary arrest, the sanctity of legal contracts freely entered into and allowed no recognition of privileges of birth. Of course, it also had its critics. The laws were seen as sexist, too conservative, damaging to agrarian economics. There were strict grounds for divorce, and of course these were more advantageous to men than to women. A wife could be imprisoned for adultery. Men could just get away with a fine. In all of this, the code reflects Napoleon's profound sexism. Women should not be looked upon as equals of men, he said. They are, in fact, only machines for making babies. On Thursday, March 25th, 1802, after nearly six months of negotiations, the Anglo-French Peace Treaty, to which France's allies Spain and Holland were also signatories, was finally signed. The lack of a commercial treaty attached to the political one meant that the powerful British merchant class soon came to oppose peace that gave them no privileged access to the markets of France, Holland, Spain, Switzerland, Genoa, and later Etruria. They, the British, thought that this was a deliberately hostile move by Napoleon. Napoleon was duly declared first consul for life on August 2nd and with the power to appoint a successor. Obviously, Josephine was 40 years old by the time, so there was no hope for them to have a child. Anyway, the Peace of Amiens gave Napoleon time to stimulate economic growth through state intervention and protectionism, and he managed to increase confidence in France's finances, but they were never able to match the British in this respect. One evening, as Napoleon and Josephine were on their way to the opera, there was an explosion close to their carriages. While they survived, the explosion did result in five deaths and over 20 injuries and some damage to the surrounding houses. After this explosion, there were copies of British newspapers implicitly and explicitly writing that they hoped that the next attempt would succeed. So in August 1802, Napoleon banned all British newspapers from France. Of course, though, he did still have some admirers in Britain. The general atmosphere was British Francophobia and matched French Anglophobia. Napoleon might have had an idea that the peace treaty would be short-lived because he also did send some men to communicate to people who weren't very friendly with the English East India Company. He also wanted a report on the strength of the British forts in India and the chances of maintaining a French army there. Eventually, the British would consider this peace treaty as a failed experiment. On March 8th, King George III delivered a king's speech asking Parliament for war supplies and mobilizing Britain's militia blaming the French for making major military operations in the French and Dutch ports. On April 23rd, Britain demanded the retention of Malta for another seven years, the ceding of the lightly populated Mediterranean island of Lampedusa, 70 miles from Tunisia as a naval base, the evacuation of Holland by France, and for compensation to be paid for the Sardinians' Piedmont. Now remember, Napoleon was given Piedmont, these were the terms of, of an armistice, after the Battle of Marengo, and he later annexed it when King Charles 
Charles Emmanuel of Piedmont refused to be a French government puppet. It's also important to add as an aside that after Napoleon and his family had left Corsica in 1793, Britain's King George III became recognized as King of Corsica and Napoleon had always wanted to take Corsica back. Napoleon and several members of foreign affairs met to discuss the British demands on May 11th. To avoid the, in fact, non-existent danger of Napoleon accepting her demands, Britain formally declared war on May 18th, 1803. Napoleon responded by interning all male Britons of military age who were still on French soil. France was a de facto empire by 1804 and Napoleon declared himself an emperor du jour, just as Queen Victoria would become for the British Empire in 1877. Astonishingly, few Frenchmen opposed the return to a hereditary monarchy only 11 years after the execution of King Louis XV, and those who did were promised an opportunity to vote against it. Napoleon and Josephine's coronation took place at Notre Dame on Sunday, December 2nd, 1804, and his crowning of himself was the ultimate triumph of the self-made man, and in one way, a defining moment of the Enlightenment. It was also fundamentally honest. He had indeed got there through his own efforts. It is possible that he later regretted it, however, because of the vaulting egoism it suggested. By 1807, Napoleon's empire wasn't even five years old and he came to the conclusion that he would need an heir, a son. After 13 years of trying, the 46-year-old Josephine clearly wasn't going to produce one. And so on November 30th, Napoleon asked Josephine to annul their marriage. You have children, he said. I have none. And the marriage was dissolved on December 16th. So it's pretty ironic that Napoleon divorced Josephine so that he could get an imperial heir. As it would turn out, it would be her grandson rather than any offspring of Napoleon who would become the next emperor of France and her direct descendants who today sit on the thrones of Belgium, Denmark, Sweden, Norway and Luxembourg. His descendants sit on none. Napoleon went on to marry Empress Marie Louise and Marie Louise's great aunt was Marie Antoinette. He'd considered taking a Parisian wife, but it was ultimately decided that he would take an Austrian wife because that would strengthen that alliance. He proposed marriage to her by the time he was 40 and she was 18. They'd had a fine enough marriage, but he would later say that even though he loved Marie Louise, he had loved Josephine more. He did come to regret the second marriage eventually, and he did partially blame it for his downfall. Napoleon Francois Joseph Charles was born on Wednesday, March 20, 1811. Despite everything he'd done for an heir, Napoleon instructed the doctors that if things were to go wrong and there was a choice to be made between the Empress's life and the baby's, they should rather save the Empress's life. The infant was declared king of Rome and Napoleon adored the son and he was a doting father. Okay I'm going to fast forward a little bit now to the Battle of Leipzig because this was a really significant one, one of the bloodiest battles in the Napoleonic Wars and another defeat for Napoleon. Among the half million men who fought at Leipzig in the Battle of the Nations, the largest battle in European history up to that moment were French, Germans on both sides, Russians, Swedes, Italians, Poles, every nationality within the Austrian Empire and even even a British rocket section. The battle was fought over three days on the 16th, 18th and 19th of October 1813 and it was on the 19th that Napoleon decided to retreat. He was still defiant though and was determined to fight as France was about to be invaded. He had rejected the peace terms that the British had offered at the end of 1813. On March 1st, 1814, the Allies signed the Treaty of Chaumont with each other agreeing to make no separate peace with Napoleon declaring their aim of each contributing an army of 150,000 men to oust him and end French influence over Switzerland, Italy, Belgium, Spain and the Netherlands. The Allies would eventually enter Paris on March 1st and Napoleon became the first French monarch to lose the capital since the English occupation of 1420-36. Fifteen years after supporting Napoleon's coup at Brumier, Charles Maurice Talleyrand launched his own coup on March 30th, 1814, and set up a provisional government in Paris that immediately began peace negotiations with the Allies. Napoleon was aware that he had few options and an abdication was likely. On April 5th, the Allies announced that they had given Napoleon a lifetime sovereignty of the Mediterranean island of Elba of Italy, and Napoleon signed a provisional abdication document. He did try to take his life by consuming poison before he left, but his valet heard him groaning in the other room and called a doctor who made him spew it out. He signed the actual abdication next morning without further hesitation, the Allied powers having declared that the Emperor Napoleon was the only obstacle to the re-establishment of peace in Europe. It stated, The Emperor Napoleon, faithful to his oath, declares that he renounces for himself and his heirs the thrones of France and Italy 
and there is no personal sacrifice, even that of life, that he would not be ready to make in the interest of France. Napoleon left for Elba on April 20th, 1814, and he arrived there in May. Shortly after he arrived on Elba, Josephine, who obviously wasn't with him, they were divorced at this point, died of pneumonia. She was 50 and five days previous, she had gone out on a walk in the cold night air with Tsar Alexander after a ball there. Napoleon said later on that, that she would have gone with him to Elba and he later decreed two days of mourning. It's not known exactly when Napoleon tried to retake his throne, but he watched closely the seemingly endless series of errors that the Bourbons made after Louis XVIII's return under Allied escort to Paris in May 1814. This was after Napoleon was exiled. Napoleon decided to leave exile in Elba on February 26, 1815. So he was there just under a year. So Napoleon returns to France and even though he had largely reconstituted his government, the Vienna Declaration made it clear that the Allies would not allow him to retain the throne. So Napoleon needed to ready France for an invasion. He hoped that his Frenchmen would actively rally him, especially now that they'd seen the Bourbon alternative, but it didn't really work. On May 15th, 1815, the Allies formally declared war on France. By June 9th, they signed the Treaty of Vienna to try and remove Napoleon from the throne, and they would not lay down arms until this was achieved. And this leads us to the Battle of Waterloo. By June 15th, Napoleon made it to Lyonie Chalewa in Belgium. He hoped to defeat the Prussian army there and then move on to the Anglo-Dutch-Belgian-German force under Duke Wellington, who was further north. He saw a small victory in Lyonie, and he was so confident in his victory there that he thought that the Prussians there would have no further impact on his campaign, so no reinforcements were sent north. The remaining Prussians, meanwhile, while, did retreat north to stay close to Wellington's army. Wellington heard what had happened, and this gave him enough time to install himself at a few miles south of Waterloo. Napoleon, meanwhile, still in Leidney, took his time visiting battalions. So by the time he arrived at Quatre Bras on June 17th, Wellington was already there. There's so many stories about Napoleon's lethargy that day. One report is that he suffered from hemorrhoids that incapacitated him after Liney. He snapped at his page for assisting him on his horse too harshly, and he didn't stay on his horse for long periods like in previous battles. Other historians suggest that he might have had a bladder infection. In the end though, there is no real evidence to show that a physical illness illness or issue impacted his decision rather than his own misjudgments and faulty intelligence. When Napoleon met his general, Delon, at Quatre Bras, he said one of two things. You have dealt a blow to the cause of France, general, or as Delon himself preferred to recall it, France has been lost. My dear general, put yourself at the head of the cavalry and push the English rearguard as hard as possible. Around 7 p.m., Napoleon called off the attack on the Anglo-Allied rearguard, as Delon had been urging him to. The Battle of Waterloo started around 11 a.m. the next day and ended up being the second costliest single-day battle of the Napoleonic Wars after Borodino. Between 25,000 and 31,000 Frenchmen were killed or wounded, and huge numbers captured. Wellington lost 17,200 men. Of course, the French were defeated, and the mystery of the Battle of Waterloo is why a collection of fine and experienced French combat generals repeatedly failed to coordinate their efforts, as they had done so successfully on many previous battlefields. After his Waterloo defeat, there was a power vacuum in Paris and effectively a parliamentary coup, and Napoleon was swiftly denounced. The next day, Napoleon abdicated for a second time. Now the tricky question was how were the British going to deal with their prisoner? The hundred days following his return from Elba had cost almost 100,000 men killed or wounded on all sides. And they couldn't risk something like this repeating. St. Helena is the place in the world best calculated for the confinement of such a person, they decided. It was also far enough away from the European world that they figured that any remaining intrigue around Napoleon would be impossible and he'd eventually be forgotten. Napoleon spent more than five and a half years on St. Helena. This was longer than his time as first consul. By late 1817, Napoleon was suffering from depression as well as liver problems, stomach pains, and perhaps hepatitis B. In early 1818, the stomach cancer that would eventually be the cause of his death 
fully took hold and he died in 1821. Much of Napoleon's family lived under papal protection in Rome after Waterloo, including his mother, who retired there with her half-brother, Cardinal Fesch. She lived to be 88 years old. So what became of Napoleon's children? Because remember, none of his descendants ended up on the throne. The illegitimate son, Count Alexandre, that he'd had with his mistress Marie Walewska, his favorite of his 22 mistresses, was given a good education and went on to have a successful career in the foreign army and and he eventually became ambassador to London. He eventually died of a heart attack at Strasbourg in 1868, aged 58. Napoleon II, the son he had with Marie Louise, joined the Austrian army, but he died at age 21 of tuberculosis. Napoleon also had another illegitimate son with a 17-year-old mistress, and the son was Count Leon, who looked a lot like his father, and later in life people stared at him on the street because of it. Although his cousin, the son of Napoleon's brother Louis, paid for his debts and gave him a pension, he died poverty-stricken and of stomach cancer in 1881. And yeah, that's basically the basics of Napoleon's life story. If you do see the movie, feel free to share your thoughts and thank you for watching.